Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's edition of Dog Dial, the show where we talk about University of Georgia football, basketball, recruiting, and much, much more. I'm your host, Paul Meharry, joined by my trusty co-host, Jake Roos of UJSports.com, and special guest, Hudson Mason, former UGA quarterback. Uh, we're here at Champions Chicken on Baxter Street in Athens, and we're ready to get the ball rolling on Georgia's National Signing Day. Jake, today was a big day for the University of Georgia as they added three new signees, Eric Stokes, Latavius Brinney, and Amir Speed. Uh, they just all happened to play defensive back. Yeah, uh, I guess we'll uh, we'll always remember this one for the defensive back haul. Uh, it wasn't, I don't think, what most anybody was expecting. I'll uh, go out and say I certainly was not expecting uh, Georgia to finish in that way. Um, but I think that it's a good move. I think that uh, it, there is a lot of uh, reason to finish that way. So um, I'm going to break that down later on in the show. And I'm sure uh, I'm sure Hudson Mason has some thoughts on uh, playing against some DBs. Yeah, I think. Uh, <laughs> Seeing Kirby, I think I heard a few of his comments today about out adding some of those skill position guys at the last minute. I think if I had to guess, their kind of thought process behind that was adding some more depth behind, on, on the special teams. You know, those guys may not, they may, may not, may or may not come in right away and play um, on defense. But if not, you know, they probably can make a huge impact on special teams. Definitely can. And we're going to talk about that and much more on this episode, special edition of Signing Day here at Champions Chicken. You're listening to Dog Dial, presented by UGASports.com. And welcome back to Dog Dial. I'm your host, Paul Meharry, joined by my trusty co-host, Jake Roos, and Hudson Mason, former UGA quarterback. And guys, today's signing day. Today was a huge day for the Georgia Bulldogs and what they accomplished uh, on and off the field in terms of their recruiting success. They were able to add three new guys, uh, all defensive backs. We broke down the names uh, when we started the show, but Jake... Let's talk a little bit more about those guys. Obviously, that's what everybody's wanting to talk about right now. There's there's a couple other names they want to talk about, but these are the ones we'll talk about first. Sure, sure. Uh, I guess we should start off with probably Aubrey Solomon. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, that was uh, that got the morning rolling. Probably yeah. not in the fashion Georgia would have wanted. Uh, but, you know, that's the way the cookie crumbles for five-star defensive tackles. I'm sorry, they just don't grow on trees, so everybody on earth wants them. And Michigan had him at one point, uh, obviously lost him later down the line. I think things uh, obviously changed uh, uh, going on uh, into his recruiting process. And I really think Michigan coaches were able to redeem themselves in a really big way. I think that that was pretty key for them. Uh, you know, I asked him about that during the interview um you know i said it seems like there was a time where uh, you know you there were some comments made during the Army All-American game, and, and then he had decommitted and said it was because they didn't know who he was. Uh, you know, there were all these things that kind of went into it, but, uh, you know, they kind of played it as, well, we, everybody deserves a second chance. Let us have that opportunity to show you that uh, that, that we really need you and that we mean a lot, uh, that we mean what we say. Uh, he also commented that Rashawn Gary, a former five-star who moved from New Jersey up to Michigan last year, um, uh, was a big influence on him. So I think all that kind of helped. And uh, and I had a, uh, a, I spoke with his mother afterward, Sabrina Caldwell, um, uh, wonderful lady, uh, very kind, and and she told me basically, uh, you know, it's no problem to send my son far away from home. Uh, yeah, you know, I, I'm about giving my kids roots and then giving them the wings to uh, to fly away and deliver on it. So overall, uh, you know, I think that it was uh, it was uh, obviously a huge hit. It always is when you lose a, a player of Solomon's caliber. But um, I will say, not totally unexpected. Speaking of unexpected, Hudson, I'm going to bring you into this. This is two years in a row. George has lost out on a five-star defensive tackle. Does that worry you at all as a former player? And now you're kind of more of an analyst looking at it, looking at it that way. From the whole class aspect, obviously everybody wanted Solomon. That was mm -hmm. that was the piece that signing day would be complete had mm -hmm. he signed with the Bulldogs. That wasn't the case. Now everybody's looking back and saying, well, that's two years in a row. How are we going to stop this trend? Yeah, I don't think so. I mean, there's so, there's so much talent in the state that you can't get everybody. Um, you know, and I saw today where uh, last year we only signed two out of the top ten uh, recruits in the state of Georgia. This year we got four out of the top six, 11 out of the top 16. So, we definitely brought in an influx and a, and a greater amount of, of overall talent from the state. But, um, you know, I personally thought that he was going to go to USC. I'd read that, you know, he had some West Coast ties, some California ties. Um, it seemed like he was leading that way a little bit. So I was a little surprised that he decided to make the jump north to cold Michigan. But, uh, you know, you can't – the coaches do what they can. They sell their pitch, and, and Georgia sells itself. But, yeah, you can't, you can't get everybody. What was your take when you were in school? Could you tell the difference between a four-star defensive tackle and a five-star? 
when they hit you? <laughs> no. <laughs> not, no, not at all. Not when they're hitting you. No, I mean, you can tell the difference between a you know 260-pound defensive end <laughs> right. and a 315-pound guy, but <laughs> no, you don't you don't feel the impact of stars. <laughs> correct, correct. Um, let's talk about the guys that Georgia did land though today. Sure. Let's talk about the three defensive backs and how they're a little bit different. Um, I was able to go out to uh, East Side and cover Eric Stokes' commitment. Um, he was extremely happy that he was a Georgia I Bulldog. I bet he was. Um, he, what I had got from that was he found out uh, late yesterday that um, he did have a commendable offer, um, something that Eric definitely wanted from the beginning. I think Eric had always been a Georgia boy. Um, he's not that far away. He's 45 minutes to an hour away from Athens itself. Um, his family always wanted him to be in Athens. And uh, when he put on that Georgia hat, he was extremely excited because he was able to do that. Um, so what does he bring to the table, Jake, besides – just amazing speed. Well, that's, I mean, you can't, you can't say besides. When Correct. You're talking I, about I guess, Eric yeah, Stokes. I guess you're right. That, that is his number one attribute. It's the main thing that Eric brings to the table. You're talking about a guy who came out in the uh, state track meet this year and, and was in the 10-4 range in the 100 meters. I mean, that's, that's Olympic-level stuff. I mean, that's getting into that area. You know, there are just not a lot of guys, period, who can run that fast. And, and I will say, Roddy and I uh, always kind of uh, talked about it. At the end of it, if you go watch the video, he's got it posted on his Twitter. Um, you can see that, like, he knows he's got it one so much that he kind of pulls up at the end. I mean, he's not even running as, as hard as he could into the end of it. So that's that's freak speed. I mean, it's it's it's, it's there's nothing else to say about it. Where do I see him fitting in? That That's the question that it becomes now with Eric. Um, you know, will he play defensive back? I know that he plays uh, some corner in, in high school and has done that. Personally, I think that you need to t- teach the kid how to catch a ball falling out of the air <laughs> and, uh, and send him on his way returning punts and kicks because there's just not a lot of guys who can, uh, st- can, can hang with that kind of speed, uh, especially, like I said, in that 100 meters. That's what makes him so deadly is uh, he only gains with acceleration. What about Amir Speed? Amir Speed, big, freaky, fast, uh, physical. That's the word that I would use uh, primarily to descri- to describe Amir. I, I think that uh, he's a-, a guy who brings the size and the physicality that Kirby Smart and Mel Tucker have talked so much about uh, in-, in increasing at Georgia. Um, you know, when you're talking about a guy who's uh, six foot three, you know, uh, pr- probably on that 200 pound range. I- I mean that's that hurts. Yeah, when, you don't see Georgia you. going to get any more small DBs, really. I mean the the SEC is so physical in its nature now that um, you know even when I was at Georgia, we we had a tendency of recruiting some really small guys. Yeah, um, there's absolutely. a kid out of Sandy Creek that I can't remember his name. Shaq Wiggins. Shaq Wiggins. Um, you know when he got to campus, <laughs> I was like, whoa, so, <laughs> this kid's still in high school or middle or middle school. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, Listen to the shade from Hudson <laughs> Mason. <laughs> <laughs> Just so happens Shaq Wiggins no, transferred but, to Louisville. But, yeah. you're, but you're right. I, I think you're. You gotta. Yeah. You can't be 180 pounds and making this in league. You know, maybe at the DB if you're super fast and big, but at safety you gotta be a 200 pounds pound guy that can lay the wood. Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree with you more. I think that Georgia feels like probably, as you said, when they when you were here, they had a tendency to recruit a lot of guys like that. I feel like they've got guys that fit that mold. Malcolm Parrish is a small defensive back. I mean, yeah. he's not a big guy. He's a guy, though, that is, is a, he's a player. I mean, don't get me wrong, but you've got some of those types in. Now it's time to bolster the ranks for yep, these correct. big physical SEC receivers you see every Saturday. Yep. Guys, we're going to take a quick break. On the other side of it, though, we're going to bring Hudson back. We're going to talk to him a little bit more about the signing class and what it means uh, to be a George Bulldog. You're listening to Dog Top and by <laughs> UJSports.com. Because you want more flavor, at Nukes we marinate and grill to perfection. Because you want the latest culinary tastes and trends, we never rest. At Nukes, great food drives us. So we are meticulous in our preparation, obsessed with the quality of our ingredients, and uncompromising about serving you our very best. We believe that sharing a memorable meal is one of life's ultimate pleasures. Join us at Nukes Eatery. And welcome back to Dog Dial. I'm your host, Paul Meharry, joined by my co-host, Jake Roos and Hudson Mason, former UGA quarterback. And we're talking signing day, guys. Big things happen for the University of Georgia. They're sitting at, is it 26? 
25? 26. 26, 26 yeah. 26, 26 with uh, Latavius Brittany coming into the fold. That's the last guy we haven't talked about that Georgia picked up, and we're going to talk about the guys they haven't. Let's talk about Brittany for a second. What did you see in Brittany? Yeah, Brittany is a guy that uh, I, I think sort of falls on the spectrum in between Amir Speed and, and Eric Stokes, mm -hmm. if, if I'm thinking about where he, his skills are. Um, I, definitely not a complete prospect, but... You're talking about another big guy, 6'2", in that 190, 195 range. And when you see him, it's very evident that he is that big. I mean, he's not one of those guys. Yeah, I, he's I, huge. I, I will say, I've seen Speed before. Speed is tall and long and, and kind of thin. He's going to have to fill out a little bit more. I'm not saying he's got a bad body. He's just got a, a frame that, that's going to require some building. Mm -hmm. With Latavius, he looks like an SEC defensive back right now. I mean, and he's only going to get bigger. So yeah. once he muscles up, it's going to be ridiculous. I think that he's a kid uh, that one thing I really like about Latavius uh, for Georgia is that they were so sold on him so early. Uh, you know, they offered him back, I think, in um, early March, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. Accepted his commitment uh, in over the summer. He decommitted, and they never really let up on him. I mean, it, we kind of talked about that maybe he would be kind of an odd man out kind of prospect, but Georgia continued to visit him. He took an official visit. I mean, it really the signs were pointing to him being yeah, a part just, of we things, didn't, we didn't and want, we just couldn't yeah, believe it. Yeah. I mean, really, that's where it was. So Georgia clearly kind of prioritized the kid. I think. I think that it was a situation with Brittany where uh, you know they made it known uh, for a long, long time that they wanted him, and and uh, they. they they got him, so I'm sure that they're very happy about the addition. So with Kirby Smart adding that size into the defensive backfield, how is that going to play on the football field? You talked about it a little bit earlier. Guys like Shaq Wiggins aren't coming in anymore. These guys are six foot. Uh, they can run. They can hit. Mm. They're a lot bigger. Um, what does that mean in terms of the football field, Hudson? Well, I think from a, maybe a quarterback perspective, you know, Kirby, it seems like his kind of recruiting kids as far as what exactly the NFL is looking like or looking for in, in DBs, long guys with long arms long wingspan that can run and um, from an offensive standpoint I mean it makes it hard because uh, it creates a, a little bit of a mismatch disadvantage on offense you know it's it's harder to take advantage of one-on-one -on -one opportunities um, you know safeties can not only play cover two schemes but they can play tight ends and man-to-man -man. Um, you know a lot of times even back in the day your safeties were smaller guys where hey if, if we were getting man coverage we got a mismatch with our tight end. You know, right. now that if you're recruiting a guy that's 6'3", 6'4", 200 yeah. pounds, that's not a mismatch anymore. <laughs> so football really all is about finding the mismatch, and, and offensively that's why that makes that so tough. Uh, you know, when you're out there and you're, and you're kind of breaking down the field, you know, from the quarterback's perspective, I mean, can you – Spot a guy who's five foot eleven as opposed to a guy who's six foot three in that defensive back. I mean, it, it, does that give you that slight yeah, moment that of far hesitation? Away, can you can, can you, you see him out there? Yeah, you can, no doubt. And and all that is leads up to your film prep and your film sure, study during sure. the week. You know, uh, Mondays or Sundays we get a list of guys' height and weights and and who they are. And and if a guy really is listed at five eleven on a sheet of paper, he's probably like five ten. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, you know, it's kind of some of the things you do in pregame warm ups where. Uh, you, I would used to memorize their height and weight and then kind of just see, do they pass the eye test, you know, and, and uh, like I said, some of the guys that are even listed six foot five eleven, you get out there and you're like, man, th this guy's a lot shorter, you know, we could probably take advantage of him in the red zone or in certain opportunities, so... It does. You, you do. Uh, you do keep your eye out for that stuff. Speaking about that, I know we're going completely off topic, but is that something that you would tell Bobo? You you tell him, look, I I can take advantage of this guy, or is that something he's telling you? A little bit of both. Yeah. Um. You know, if I'd work one side of the field, uh, you know, I can't see the whole side of the field. So there's eyes from coaches up in the box and the you know backup quarterbacks sure. on the sideline and. You come to the sideline and everybody is telling you, hey, I saw this or I saw this. You know, we worked this side, but, hey, next time if we call this play, you know, be ready because if they play the same coverage, let's go back over here. So, you know, I used to – I used to, I went to the the Manning camp and uh, yeah. they allowed us to sit down and pick the brain of Pey Peyton and Eli. And this is just how cerebral Peyton is. But he would say a lot of times he would throw a ball into a certain coverage and before the ball was even completed, he would turn and look – to the other side just to see how they were playing the, the certain receivers over there. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, like, how aware are you of everything that's <laughs> yeah. going on? To throw a ball and then to turn to look and say, oh, okay, maybe they were playing man over here. Next time when I come back to that, I might attack over <laughs> yeah. here. That's, that's incredible. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I, but I, I, think, I think that what you're saying brings up a great point. I know that there were some people today, and we got Debbie Downer here next to me, who said, like, maybe this wasn't the greatest way to finish it this wasn't. thing off. It wasn't, Jake. I, You said that. It wasn't. I disagree with you. We've, I got, think, we've, got, we've got seven minutes. 
minutes. Oh, I know go. we've got seven minutes, and, go. and we're going to go. Uh, it's, it's, I think it's a situation where Georgia, what do you want? They address their needs. Okay. Did they add uh, elite players at almost every position? Yeah. Sure. Yes. Um, did they uh, get bigger at the positions they said they wanted to get bigger sure. at? Sure. Yes. The hay was in the barn before today. Everything, now, now, everything that happened on National Signing Day, I said it going into this week, Everything that happened today was going to be uh, it was was going to be cherry. Now I'm not talking about the hay that's already in the barn. I think the hay that's already in the barn, the proverbial barn, is great. What I'm talking about is today. You had Nico Collins. You didn't take him. You had uh, Aubrey Solomon. He went to Michigan. Jamias Williams. You had Big Cat. These are big time guys that can help change your program that sure. aren't here at the University of Georgia. Three of them are from your home state. Sure. And then you went out and got an Eric Stokes. You went out and got a Latavius Brinney, who Brinney was down to Georgia, FIU, and FAU. Sure. But he wasn't down to any other Florida schools. Yeah. The big time Florida schools. Eric Stokes was down to Ole Miss and, Ole, and Florida. Sure. Though. So sure. I mean, you've got a guy who's He's going a project, though, three. at the same time. Sure, of course he is. But that tells you that there's something that three SEC coaches saw in the guy. The, the thing about it is, you're talking about, you know, Hudson brought up the point, there's so much talent in this state, you're not oh, ever going to be able to keep it in. And the, and the fact of the matter is, we've seen it play out many times, there are, there are parents, there are coaches, there are uh, grandparents, there are trainers, there are a, a number of kids who are involved in these decisions well yeah. beyond these kids. If some of these kids had their druthers, who knows? You know, maybe maybe they would have made a different decision. Sure. But it is what it is. The family plays a large role in all of these decisions. And I'm not saying that, that Georgia ended up losing out. I, I don't think that any of these decisions was made by a, one of those people. I think that a lot of these kids, uh, you know, were very familiar with those places. I think that they were, uh, you know, um, uh, if, not even just familiar, but 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 fans of, you know, that where they ended up. So, um, you know, Marcavius Bryant a year ago we were predicting he, he would go to Auburn. Well, that, now he did. <laughs> All I'm saying is at the end of the day when you go to sleep on signing day, Georgia getting three defensive backs on signing day was is that the ideal thing that they wanted? No. No. It's okay. not. So, it's yeah. not ideal. So, so but is it a letdown? But is it a letdown? I don't yeah, think so. I think so. No. What about you, Hudson? Come on in. I don't know specifically where with the guys on especially the defensive side of the ball in the secondary their depth if I knew more of their depth situation and, and only bring in three guys in, that may be a, a red flag. I know the one position that they got to replace is the nickel star position, which you're seeing more spread defenses now than ever, and that nickel position is the hardest position to play in the secondary, and it's the most important. Oh, sure, and absolutely. So, you know, Georgia got an Alabama transfer. I can't remember his name last Marie year. Maurice Smith. Maurice Smith, and I believe he played the nickel position, and he's he gone, right? right? So somebody's going to have to step into that spot. I don't really have a clue who it's going to be. If it's a young freshman, I know that's a really t challenging spot for a young freshman to play. Sure. Um, but each individual case, it's hard to sit here and say, you know, how could Georgia miss out on Brian or how could they miss out on so-and-so. It's, it's hard to know from an outsider perspective because you really don't know, you know, why didn't it work out? Was it just the kid not very interested in Georgia? Maybe the kid wasn't interested in the position coach. Sure. You know, maybe, um, you know, a kid's got so many great opportunities, and you sit there and say, well, why wouldn't a, would a kid from in-state not want to come to the University of Georgia? Some kids are just like, you know what, I'm tired of being in Atlanta. I'm tired of being around home. So you don't, you never really know what's going through a kid's head uh, in each individual case. Yeah, absolutely. All, all I'm saying with the class, and I'll leave it at this, is that, it's an amazing class. I think the guys that they had before signing day, incredible, best class I think they've ever had. I think Patrick Garvin, one of our writers, is, is getting on that, and I think it's Georgia's best class ever, period. Yeah. Um, it's just signing day didn't work out like they wanted it to. That's all I'm saying. There were some other big fish that they wanted to fry, and they weren't able to catch them. You, uh, yeah. It, that's all I'm saying. Sure, sure. And that's what's going to leave a but lot I'll, of people I'll tell you what, with I'll, bad taste in their mouth. I'll tell you what. There were a lot of schools around the, the country that wish that would have traded their signing day surprises and big, oh, absolutely. big, big surprises for, absolutely. for Georgia's class. Oh, sure. So I, I'm totally agreeing. I, I think that it's, I think it's just short. I think it's short-sighted, personally, to, to, to look at it from that perspective. Could there have been more hype? Could there have been more? Yes, of course. Uh, th there's no doubt about it. But, you know, somebody I, – I, I read this post earlier on, on the message boards at UGASports.com, and I, I thought that this spoke to the mentality that sometimes people get into. They said, they said, this class is good enough to win the East, but it's not necessarily good enough to win a national championship. I said, okay, fair. 
let's start with winning the East. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Let's, let's get over can that this, hump can and then beat Vanderbilt. Yeah can, <laughs> yeah, can you get over that hump first, and then can you move on from there? Then you got to win the SEC. You got to lay these foundations. Those things, uh, frankly, just haven't been in place in the last couple of years. So it gives them the opportunity to start laying that base that Kirby Smart wants to build, the direction he wants to take the team in, and this is where it starts. This is these are the building blocks. I mean, last year uh, the majority of that class was still Mark Rick's class. This is Kirby's vision. You're getting to see it. It's tall defensive backs. Absolutely. It's big, massive offensive linemen. It's guys who uh, kind of roam in that uh, the middle of the defense, the outside, inside linebacker position, guys who can flip in and out of there and rotate through. Those are the big things for me. You're getting a very clear sense of what he wants to do, and I think he delivered on that. Could he have gotten some surprises? Yeah, no doubt. I think sometimes also we put a little bit of too much emphasis on just the recruiting aspect. I mean, um, as a coach, you don't get to this level if you're not a great recruiter, but just as important as being a great player developer. Sure. You know, what, as soon as you step on campus here, uh, the reality is is the coaches, they don't really tend to care about you as much as they did. Oh, yeah. Now, I'm not saying that in a bad way. No, no, but the reality is, yeah, you're, you're, yeah. You're, you know, the coaches, it's all about production now. Correct. And, um, you know, I think that's where the coaches at, across the country and specifically at the University of Georgia, you've got this, that's part, that's half of the pie. Get the great players in, but what do you do with them now once they once they get their foot on campus? You're exactly right, Hudson. We're going to take a quick break. We're going to come back. Great discussion going on right now on Dog Dial, presented by UJSports.com. And welcome back to Dog Dial. I'm your host, Paul Meharry, joined by my co-host, Jake Roos, and also special guest, Hudson Mason, former UGA uh, star quarterback. <laughs> you have the completion rating percentage. Okay. Record. Yeah. Record. Th- that That's pretty big. That's all I'm saying. Um, we got handed some stats during our break from our stat guy, Dave McMahon, and uh, these are great. He says... Things that weigh the same as our six offensive linemen combined. He's talking about Georgia's six offensive linemen that signed today. Uh, Hudson, you want to go with the first? Yeah, let's go with that. Uh, one fully grown brown, brown bear <laughs> or two grand pianos. <laughs> uh, uh, so you've got you, – that, that's a lot of man, okay? Uh, 2,192 footballs. Or even more if used by Tom Brady. Hey, oh, hey, wow. Man, I didn't read man, that. I did not read that before we went on. My man Dan Quinn is going <laughs> to be checking the pressure in everything this weekend. I For guarantee sure. it, dude. Uh, also, uh, if you're trying to weigh it out in terms of uh, where we are, Champions Chicken, uh, about, about 10 of these chicken tenders will get you up to the weight of those, uh, those six linemen. Man, uh, they'll fill you up. I promise you that. Um, but massive guys, massive guys. Uh, you know, and, and I think that. Uh, that was really the st- like I said the story for everybody. There wasn't a, there wasn't a an um, Isaiah McKenzie. There wasn't a, a, a Miko Hardman. There wasn't a um, a Shaq Wiggins or or a, a Malcolm Parrish. I mean, there was no, there's nobody that looks like that who's a part of this class, and and that's a big departure I think from what a lot of people are used to. I think a lot of people are looking at it. They want that new Isaiah McKenzie, but with the coaching change, they didn't recruit Isaiah McKenzie. They might not be looking for an Isaiah McKenzie. No, I, I think that's I think that's what we've learned I from think this signing. You're totally class. seeing two different um, kind of plans or thought processes or identities and in, in what they're looking for from Coach Rick's staff to Kirby Smart staff. Correct. Um, I think that's not his day. Is is seeing the little bit of time that he had last year, who he brought him, but specifically the, the group of guys that he's bringing in this year. Yeah, because everybody was asking today while we were at, at Blind Pig and, and Champies here, who's the next Isaiah McKenzie? And and we we had talked about it. We always thought that they would bring in another Isaiah McKenzie. It doesn't look like they have one, though. But I think that you, I think you've already got that guy on campus. That's the thing. you got Miko Harbour. Well, yeah, you already who yeah. is that same player, in my opinion. I, you know, he, And, in fact, he's a little bit bigger than Isaiah. Oh, he's and, a lot bigger. Uh, so uh, I think that he's got a chance to do some of those things, same things with even more physicality and, and, and be able to take more shots and things of that nature. you just got to put him in those situations. Obviously, he came into the fold at Georgia. Uh, they told him he was going to get a run at defensive back, first off. I don't think that's totally out of the question. However, Kirby Smart did say to today in the signing day press conference that they're definitely not ruling out the opportunity for uh, taking Miko on the offensive side of the ball. Having watched him there, I think it's his best position oh, uh, by by far and by large. Uh, he's super twitchy. He's super fast. I, I really hope that, that Georgia fans get a chance to see him uh, playing in that position next year. Who were your top receivers when you were a quarterback? Uh, 
the year I played. Yeah. Uh, we had Michael Bennett and Chris Conley. Everybody else was hurt. <laughs> <laughs> so, so those two guys were, what, 6'2", yeah. give or take? Yeah. Now George is recruiting those 6'2", 6'3", wide receivers yeah. at a regular. That's all they brought in this year. Tell us a little bit about the difference in throwing to an Isaiah McKenzie as opposed to a 6'3". Yeah, guy. it's tough. I mean, you know, Isaiah, those type of guys – you know, I think Isaiah McKenzie, I think guys like Wes Welker and, and Danny Amendola, which those guys serve their great purposes. I mean, they're great players. Um, outside, though, as far as being a guy that can stretch the field and, and being a guy like A.J. Green or Chris Durham or Tavares King that has the speed to take the top off the coverage, you know, every every type of receiver, and you want to recruit a, spe- a specific for receiver for what your offensive scheme is. And every team needs to be able to push the ball down the field. But what I've seen with Georgia that – they're really lacking is is somebody that can really just take the top off the coverage and um you know when you can't do that now all of a sudden defenses tend to not respect you as much and now all of a sudden you start to see eight men in the box and football is, an, is a numbers game it's hard for Jim Chaney to, to call up uh plays to give the ball to Nick Chubb when you know you got eight guys in the box I don't care how good Nick Chubb is it's a numbers game and when you've got more guys on defense in the box because they don't respect your ability to throw the ball down the field um it makes it hard to be productive as an offense. And like you said, I think that that happened several times last season. I think the yeah. defense is keyed in on that, no locked doubt. it in, and said, we're going to make a freshman quarterback make some throws to beat us. And, yeah. uh, you know, good luck. And they just didn't have the wide receiver firepower last year. I mean, that, those guys struggled with even the basics. I mean, catching and, and, and yeah. really, I mean, catching is the basic. <laughs> I mean, we saw that. We, we, you know, we even saw that my senior year. Yes. Yeah, we've, um, seen it. we've seen it for the last four or five years. Really. I mean, we were not a – a very good downfield threat team yeah uh my senior year you know we had three of maybe the best backs you know at one time to ever come through the university of georgia and and bobo was an incredible mastermind at you know putting those guys in different positions a lot like kyle shanahan with the two running backs in atlanta um creativity wise um but you know we only had we had Michael Bennett and we had Chris Conley. Um, Malcolm Mitchell was there. Justin Scott Wesley was gone because of a, a drug issue. So, you know, two guys that thrive more of possession receivers from the inside can play outside, but it's not really their natural their natural home. We didn't have that guy that could take the top off the coverage. So it does limit your ability as an offense. Uh, I, we've got a couple of questions yeah. here. i got a couple uh, quick takes here. Um, highlight of the class, in your opinion. Highlight of the class? Go ahead, Hudson. Oh, man. Um, I don't want to put too much expectation on one guy. Um, I think Jake Fromm plays an important role just because he's going to come in. And, and, um, you know, I'm not saying uh, Jacob Eason, his his job is in jeopardy or anything, but he could step – Jake Fromm could step on campus from day one. I know he's already here and and automatically be the number two guy. Sure. And so – which he probably will be. Um, And so he's got to be ready to go from from the get-go, and I know he's going to push Jacob Eason and make him better and make the team better. Um, you know, Isaiah Wilson, offensive tackle from Brooklyn, I think is a huge get. Uh, he's the highest rated player, I believe, on the offensive line yep. that, that Georgia got. But adding some size, which Georgia's offensive line desperately, desperately needed. And uh, I think from just looking at the guy's size and weight, you guys have seen all these offensive line move and doing camps and how do they bend and athletically. I haven't seen that. But just from a size, looking at their height and weight, it looks like all the guys that Georgia recruited, especially up front, are guys that can come in and play right away completely agree offensive line's got to be the highlight in my opinion yeah. to, to get a guy like uh demarcus hayes took a name right uh, out of my mouth a, a juco guy who can come in and contribute immediately also uh, a couple guys like uh, notori and justin schaefer who are those big uglies who do the dirty work in the middle for you that's good stuff i think also one big thing the secondary that they brought in the mm-hmm. massive amount of depth that they brought in adding yeah. those three guys today it brings them up to seven guys total that they brought in on the defensive backfield i think you're going to find at least two guys to play pr- Pretty big roles for you next year. doesn't matter who it is. Do you guys know anything about the name Jake Skull? I do. We do. We're going to talk about that okay. on the other side of the break, though. <laughs> You're listening to Dog Dial, presented by UJSports.com. Because you want more flavor, at Nukes we marinate and grill to perfection. Because you want the latest culinary tastes and trends, we never rest. At Nukes, great food drives us. So we are meticulous in our preparation, obsessed with the quality of our ingredients, and uncompromising about serving you our very best. We believe that sharing a memorable meal is one of life's ultimate pleasures. Join us at Nuke's Eatery.
And welcome back to Dog Dial. I'm your host, Paul Meharry, joined by my trusty co-host, Jake Roos and Hudson Mason, former UGA star quarterback. And guys, we've been breaking down the class, breaking down what it means for Georgia, um, breaking down what type of different offensive philosophies at Cheney. You can see them recruiting different type of guys now. Hudson, the question I want to ask you, though, is this an overall great signing day for you? For yeah, University I think Georgia? so. Um, you know, I don't read too much into how many stars – teams got but I mean anytime you can sign a top five class that means you're bringing in really good players it does seem like maybe this this signing class or this year go around was a little melodramatic the to what uh that's all I was saying Hudson <laughs> that's all I was saying Thanks but that may be a up. good thing you know Kirby kind of hit the nail on the head as far as uh they had 12 guys take one one visit you know and, and what does that speak to it speaks to a lot, a lot of guys that knew where they wanted to go yeah and uh you know i saw a kid today some kid that went to usc who stood up and pulled two shirts off and the last shirt was a usc shirt <laughs> and i'm thinking to myself uh, I'm, I'm sitting there thinking to myself like i mean how much how much ego do you have to have to pull that off i yeah. mean i understand putting a hat on and doing all these things but you know and you don't have it you don't see any of that with the george guys you see a lot of kids that knew where they want to go they want to get to campus. They want to start making an impact, and I think that's a good thing. I, Paul wanted fireworks and cakes. and all Yeah, and, I think that's pretty know. cool. <laughs> no, but no, I, I definitely get what Hudson's saying, and, and I think that they have a very good class in terms of character. That's something we haven't touched on. Sure. The, the character of this class with guys like Jaden Hunter, with guys like Deontay Demery, with guys like Notori Johnson, they all became a family very early on, mm -hmm. and I think that's what Hudson's hitting on. They have these guys coming in, and they are all – extremely yeah. bought into what Kirby Smart is Seems selling. like a lot of them were recruiting each other. Exactly, yep. yeah. A huge group text, things of that nature. And there's a big feeling when you get something like that going where, uh, you know, we're talking about, uh, you know, responsibility and how these guys will, will shape out. You know, there, there's a my brother's keeper. It's a camaraderie. I, exactly. Yeah. You know, uh, J Jaden Hunter and Malik Herring, uh, you know, Jaden's not going to let Malik be getting into too much trouble. Correct. And if he is, Jaden's going to be there with him. Correct. <laughs> I'm telling you, that's that's just how it's going to be. I don't think some of these guys know how much trouble they can get in <laughs> in, in, in Athens. So I don't know that anyone can get in trouble in Athens, oh, Hudson. Boy. I don't know what you would even be speaking of. <laughs> yeah. um, but I, I really I think that that's so important. I think, I'm glad you, you said that because I, I do. There's a sense of camaraderie with these guys. Um, Richard LeCount is, is the dad dad of this group i mean he these are his these are the guys he's put under his wing and mm -hmm. he says you're you're my brothers let's go out here and do this together that's huge man you, to have a guy like that I, I can't think of in the last you know I, i've been this is my fourth signing day that i've, I've covered full time um I, there's not been a guy like that for georgia in the last four classes that i was really the rallying point for the whole group correct this camaraderie that they have here did you guys have that Back when you were in at Hudson, did you guys have that one guy that kind of brought you guys all together, kind of like how Richard was? I know people love to have that behind the scenes, you know, your, your how your recruitment went and things of that nature. Obviously, yeah, we know no. about your recruitment, but did you guys have one that kind of brought yeah. you all together? No, not really. I mean, I got offered really late, so I wasn't as close-knit. I didn't come on any official visits or, or even unofficial visits in the fall and hanging out with guys. Um, I played against Michael Bennett and Brandon Burroughs in high school, a guy from Alfred and Walton, so I knew who they were, and but never was really that close of friends with them. But, uh, you know, when I got here and I went on my official visit and I signed, you know, you, the guys in your class are the guys that you really become the closest with. Um, I can remember um, – the quarter, the receiver that went to Tennessee from North Georgia in my class, he was committed. Derek Rogers. Derek Rogers, Rogers thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Him and Nash Nance kind of had a little one-two punch. Yeah. And, and uh, I know they were uh, to get Derek, you had to offer Nash. <laughs> um, but I remember Stacy Searles calling me up, asking me to to call to call Derek, and I didn't know Derek from Adam. You know, and I'm sitting here thinking, <laughs> you think Derek Rogers, the number top five player in the country, is going to accept some scrawny little three stars phone call from? <laughs> I mean, come on, dude. Like, hey, Derek, it's hot today. Like, hey, come to Georgia, I really need you. I mean, you know, I don't know. So, so I, I kind of blew that off. and was like. Tell us a little bit about once they get to campus, Hudson. What they're coming in, that they, their egos have been pumped up yeah. since freshman year, man. I mean, they've been to so many camps. The opening yeah. rivals five star. They're they're a five star. They're a four star. Do they bring the swagger or are they nervous? Yeah, when they come in, do, do they? It's, it's a little bit of mixture. Okay. I mean, you know, I and do you bump those kids down pretty quick? Yeah, you do. I, <laughs> I can remember um, when Christian Lemay got to campus. Oh, he was big shot. Uh, yeah, he was, and uh, I can remember we were running stadiums. The very first summer, he had just gotten there, so one of the very few few workouts. And he was, you know, when you get there and you're working out and stuff, you, the best thing to do is kind of just stand in the background and, and slowly get your feet wet with guys. 
And uh, one of the older guys, Ruben Faloki, was like throwing up and kind of lacking, and, and he jumped on him. And uh, he kind of gave him his opinion, and, and Ruben, Ruben just straight up told him, you, you know, I can't repeat what he yeah. said here. But, and I remember thinking to myself, I'd already been there a year and a half, and, you know, I was slowly kind of just taking that leadership role, but nothing what the responsibility that Christian felt like he should take at the moment. And I thought, holy, holy moly, dude, like you've been here two days. You know, so it, it – I think a lot of guys that try to come in and, and uh, it's it's a little bit of a territorial thing. You know, you got to earn your respect, and you got to you got to you know you just can't show up day one and think, hey, I'm a five star, so you know, roll out the red carpet for me. Um, and the and the reality of it is, is as soon as you sign those papers, man, um, you know, it's it's never really the same. It's all about production now. And and uh, when you get on campus, it doesn't matter how you got there. It doesn't matter if you got offered day one or, or the very last minute. What matters is. The impact that you make, and do you make a difference on the field? And do you make a difference off the field? We got about a minute left in this segment, Hudson. Uh, you mentioned earning that respect and guys coming on the campus. Where's that one? Is it in the weight room? Is it in the film room? Is it on the practice field? I think is it's it, everywhere. I mean, is it all of that? Yeah, is it, it's the full package. It's totally everywhere. Um, you know, because you can. You, we've been around guys that want to lead on the field um, and say, "Hey, do the right, do the right thing," and then you know they're downtown Athens you know, passed out on the sidewalk, you know, and I'm not saying that um, somebody or I'm not saying I'm holier than now and I'm not saying that, you know, I haven't had a good time in Athens, but it's you earn your respect by everything you do uh, every single second of the day and, and, you know, you don't talk about it, be about it, you know, be the first guy in the weight room, be the guy getting extra reps, be the guy on Sunday afternoon when everybody else is at home watching games, sitting sitting in there breaking down film and guys catch on to that, you know, they – they see one of the hardest guys I've ever been around, hardest working guys, was Faton Bauda. And, um, you know, he, he worked his butt off, and it didn't really work out for him. Um, but everybody knew that Faton was one of the hardest workers that they ever been around by the way he, he did it. Yeah, we've all been passed out on the sidewalk in downtown. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't. Been. We're going to take a break, come back from that. You're listening to Dog Down, presented by UGASports.com. <laughs> All right, and welcome back to Dog Dial. It is our final segment. Everybody knows that. I want to th- give a couple quick shout-outs here to uh, to round things out. First off, got to shout-out Hudson Mason. Yeah, man. Brought some killer stories today. Had me cracking up. Uh, the, the, the Rick Rogers story is one I'm going to remember for a long time. So uh, <laughs> thank you for clowning on yourself a little, Hudson. It's, yeah, it's, it was great to have your inside <laughs> yeah, as well. Yes. Uh, also, uh, got to shout-out the Fountains. Uh, they came all the way from where? Dallas, Dallas, Georgia. Dallas, Dallas, Texas. Texas. Georgia. Oh, that was oh, Georgia. Georgia. That's a little bit closer, but <laughs> all the same, we're really ha- we're really happy the Fountains came out here uh, to see us um, at Champy's Chicken on Baxter Street. Uh, you may notice uh, Paul's got a little a little friend with him. Um, signing day was wrapping up. Uh, we got about four minutes here. Um, let, I wanted to ask Hudson a question. Go for it, Hudson. The guys who you were talking about ripping the shirts off and, and going, you know, Tennessee to USC, and then he signs with Florida or whoever at USC it was, do the coaches kind of take that a little personal once he gets on campus? A buddy of mine was asking me that last night. Do the coaches take that personal like, man, you really put us through hell and, and getting you here? Is it, <laughs> is it more like, you know, we're going to run you a little harder? I don't think so. Okay. No, I think they're probably just happy to have a good a good player on <laughs> yeah. campus. Um, but – I think after maybe year one or year two, if he kind of turns into a dud, uh, you know, they're <laughs> reminded of that. Yeah, they, they <laughs> think he could, yeah, absolutely. Um, all right, so we got, uh, like I said, about three minutes here left. Uh, let's hit on a couple things. Um, uh, uh, Hudson gave us a couple takes on, on highlights in the class. Uh, Paul, you got anybody uh, that you're looking at as a sleeper in this class? I know you love your sleepers. I do love my sleepers. Um, sleeper in this class, you know, I think I think you have a couple candidates. I think Jeremiah Hallman was not talked about in the level that he should be. Yeah, he I was think at UGA Sports. He was. He was indeed. <laughs> if you were a member of the site, you knew that. Um, I think Jeremiah Hallman is going to be a stud. I also think uh, Mark Webb. He is a very highly rated guy, but 
I think that Mark Webb is going to come in and fight for playing time his freshman year. No doubt. Um, those are my two guys. I think they need help at wide receiver. Um, and, uh, yeah, Jake, go ahead. Uh, you know, for me, I think it's, it's going to be Trey Bishop. Uh, you, I think that uh, when you've got a guy of his size, his athleticism, you're talking about a guy who uh, came in as a three-star, and I get it. He's an athlete. He's a, uh, one of those guys who played a lot of offense in high school. It looks like he's probably going to translate in a corner or safety. I'll tell you what. Very fast, very physical, very big guy. Trey is a guy who I, I can see maturing very quickly and getting himself uh, into a, uh, into a spot quickly. I agree with Mark Webb. I think Mark Webb has a chance. I'm not saying this is going to happen, but I think he's got a chance to be Georgia's best receiver next year. And I, I know yeah. that those are huge expectations, yeah. but he's that well rounded, and I don't know that they've had a prospect as well rounded as him in the in the wide receiver fold in a very long time. Um, guy, you still. Work Worried about Isaiah Wilson? Let's talk about that real quick. Yeah, I, I think I think you got a guy in Isaiah Wilson who he's coming from New York, Hudson. He's 370 pounds, and my argument is once he gets down to this Georgia heat, he's gonna have a rude <laughs> awakening. Tell me yeah. about that. I, I mean, to get a kid out of Brooklyn, I'm thinking to myself, how in the world? You know, I didn't even know Georgia recruited New York. Yeah, but I, but I heard Kirby say today that they actually came down to a camp this past summer, and his high school coach kind of kicked it off with a lot of their coaches here, but he's going to be a great addition because Georgia loses three offensive linemen, and that is the, that is the one position where Georgia's got to fill immediately. And, and if you're looking at kind of how Georgia's season is going to go next year, I'd be willing to say that depending on how they play, it could be depending on how – Georgia season go, so yeah, yeah, they're definitely they, going to carry the team on their back. Yeah, live and die by those offensive yeah. linemen for sure. Um, uh, Paul, you, you mentioned Isaiah Wilson. I guess my guy, I, I've said it before, Robert Beal is a guy that I, I think still has some time to develop, uh, has some time where he can uh, still grow and uh, and really kind of find his rotation. The good news for him and for Georgia, I think, with Robert is uh, that he's got some really talented guys ahead of him. There's no need for him to step in day one like it might be with some of these offensive linemen or even some of these wide receivers. He's, he's got some great guys to learn under. Davin Bellamy and Lorenzo Carter are about as a good of a tandem as you could uh, study for the uh, outside linebacker position. So I'm um, looking forward to watching him. Uh, who's going to be your big surprise in the class? I think Jake Fromm. I think he's going to fight for playing time the whole time. Oh, baby. I love it. I love the Jake Fromm pick. And I, I think Hudson's right behind me with that one. I think Jake Fromm's going to come in and fight for playing time. Jake Fromm from State Farm. Right? There <laughs> you go. Gonna, he's going to push him. He's going to push him. I, I think that uh, uh, I'm going to go with Matt Landers as my big surprise. I think Matt is a guy who was underrated. Not as many people knew him. Um, but he's long. He's fast. He makes very physical catches and knows how to use that size great. So, uh I think that's it for us. That's it. We're going to wrap it up, guys. Thank you so much for tuning in to this edition of Dog Dial. Uh, make sure uh, that you're uh, tuning in uh, over at Facebook.com. Come out and see us at Champies uh, at 5 p.m. on uh, Tuesdays. And for myself, Hudson Mason, and Isaiah Crowell, <laughs> Paul Meharry, uh, we thank you for tuning in. Thanks, guys. <laughs> you said Isaiah. <laughs>